tear. Here. There's not a better place than you can be than here this morning. There's not a better thing you can be doing than what you're doing right now. And that's worshiping God. I'm thankful that you have chosen to be here. We pray that today will be a great blessing. If you will, let's go to God in prayer. God, we pray that you'll be with us today as we see your word. Help us to live it out. Lord, help us to find you and to draw more closely to you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Education is pretty important. I think most of us agree with that, and, and it's one of those things that we, we look at how that's going to work out. I know school uh, families think about what schools their kids are going to go to. We buy houses in certain parts of town based on school system. We may choose to do public school or private school or home school. There's all different kinds of options. Then when it comes to uh, graduate school or going to college, what am I going to do? Where am I going to go? What quality of education am I going to have? Those are the things we look at. I, I did see a, a meme this week that made me laugh. They said, well, I think at all graduation ceremonies, even though we let the valedictorian talk, we ought to let whoever came in last in the class speak too. So I want to hear both sides. <laughs> I sent that to a friend of mine. He said, well, he said, the valedictorian of my class makes 75 a year. He said, the guy that came in last makes half a million a year in his body shop. He said, he did okay. All right. Education is important. Why? Because there's something about knowledge and that, that gap between ignorance and knowledge and, and, and trying to learn something because there's some things we learn, there's certain information we learn that should lead to a change of thought, a change of feeling, and a change of action. And I believe when we know about God, that's exactly what the knowledge should do. See, I think there's a danger sometimes in us becoming very fact-oriented only with Scripture. I remember when I finished my, my graduate degree in, in Bible, that, uh, in ministry, that one of our uh, guys came up and he just said, okay, you got a master's degree in Bible. Does that mean that you learned all the books of the Old Testament in order and learn how to spell Habakkuk? Actually, I didn't. I didn't have a class on that. See, sometimes we can treat Bible knowledge. And I hear some people say, well, that person knows their Bible back and forth. They may, but do they know the God of the Bible? Do they know the story of Scripture? Do they know the love that is there? Do they know what has been read? We'll do it for the third time today, and I may read it every few minutes. It's that beautiful. That for God so loved the world that He gave His only, one and only Son, that, so who, that whosoever believes in Him shall not perish, but have eternal life. For God did not send His Son in the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through Him. We've talked about that all weekend. That God wants to save you. He has done everything in His power to make it possible for our salvation. And the symbols of that are a cross and a tomb. To know that Jesus lived a perfect life and, and at the end of that perfect life, instead of rewarding Him for coming in first, in a sense, He, he lived this life perfectly. Instead of rewarding Him, He was put on a cross. And He was crucified not for His sins because He had none, but for our sins who were put on Him. And then on the third day He was raised up, showing us that He has defeated sin and He has defeated death. Because of His death on the cross, our sins could be taken away. Because of Him being raised on the third day, we will also be raised from the dead. It's incredible what He does. Let me ask you, does that knowledge change anything about you? Does that change our thinking, our feeling, and our action? I hope it does. I got a confession to make that this may surprise some of y'all. And if it does, I, 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 that's okay. I, I, I like surprising people sometimes. Uh, and I, the confession is, I used to watch Oprah some. <laughs> I did. And there's an interview that I have not forgotten where she interviewed Maya Angelou. Now, I can't speak as deep as Maya, so I'll do my best, all right? She's got a deep voice. 
And as Oprah was talking to her about her life and what she had learned in her life, she had this quote. She said, I did what I knew, but when I knew better, I did better. I thought that was beautiful. That should be all of us, right? We do the best we can with what we know at the point, and if we find out something that is new, that is truly helpful, that is true, then we want to improve whatever we know. And the way we show that we have improved is we do better, right? That's it. If we went to a doctor right now and said, all right, what do I need to do to be healthy? It depends on what doctor you go to, correct? And and I know some people have stopped going to doctors. They get their health advice from TikTok clips. No degree necessary, okay? But I grew up hearing a statement, and that statement was, an apple a day does what? Keep the doctors away. Would you believe at one time... Doctors would say one of the healthiest things you could do is smoke a cigarette. You may say, Craig, I don't think so. I promise they did. They sure did. You look here, it says, in the 16th century, European doctors were extolling the virtues of tobacco for things like, you ready for this, for asthma. You have an asthma attack, light up a Marlboro. I mean, it's just like, don't don't reach out for your inhaler. Shortness of breath, bad breath, and even cancer. Let that sit in. That was the most educated people of their time. And it continued on, by the way. It wasn't just in the 16th century. Earlier in the last century, more doctors smoked camels than any other cigarette. This is a real advertisement that was out. Nearly 21,000 physicians say that luckies are less less irritating. It somehow toasts your throat, and that way it's better. (laughs) I'm being serious. I'm not making this up. Your dentist recommends smoking. Not only that, (laughs) please don't get offended at the next ones, all right? Somehow, smoking is supposed to chill you out because they use babies, all right? It says, gee, Mommy, before you scold me, would you smoke a Marlboro? That's real. Those are real advertisements. That's a far cry from what we get today, right? You look on the side of a pack of cigarettes, and there are warnings all the way down, right? Could cause health issues, could cause all these different problems. They even talk about the danger of secondhand smoke and thirdhand smoke. So we have a generation that doesn't know what it's like to walk in a restaurant and you choose a side, and it really doesn't matter what side you choose, it's all smoking, right? You just sort of choose that the people next to the table of you're doing it. But we've learned these dangers, and, and so the thing is, now we know that it is dangerous and it will cause health issues. There's different information that we have. See, it's not just smoking. Uh, This is one that uh, sort of blew me away a little bit. Eben Myers was a 49-year-old wealthy Pittsburgh industrialist who was looking to ease his chronic pain he was having in his arm. The year was 1927, and Eben was advised by his doctor to try a powerful new drug to cure his pain. It was called Radithor. And he took it for two years. And as he said, it worked really well until after two years, his jaw fell off. It was radiation. It was a doctor who told him to do it. Guess what? Unless you're dealing with cancer in some shape or form, they're not going to suggest you do this. We've learned this with lead paint. We've learned this with asbestos. At one time, we didn't know better, right? But now we do. And since we know better, we don't want to do that anymore. I want to ask you this. What about when it comes to our salvation? When it comes to what we need to do in order to be saved, whose advice do we follow? Whose command do we follow? Do we we follow just somebody out on the street? Do we follow Jesus the master teacher? I think it would be good if we followed Jesus the master teacher. 
the gospel of Christ. That we know that yes, He died on the cross, He was raised on the third day. And that is good news that, that people who sin, and that's all of us, can be saved, that, that as, as Keller has said, we are more sinful than we could ever imagine, yet we are more loved than we could ever comprehend. The beauty of the gospel of Jesus. And when Jesus tells His disciples to go make disciples, He tells them to do this. Go therefore and make disciples, Matthew 28, 19 and 20. Of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all things I have commanded you. And lo, I'm with you always, even to the end of the age. Don't forget verse 18. All authority has been given to me on heaven and earth. Jesus says, I'm the authority. I have the right to tell you what you need to do to be saved. And He does. He does. This is new. Before this, salvation was primarily for who? For the Jews. And the way that people were saved was through sacrifice. People they were saved was through uh, uh, choosing to be proselyted and become Jewish. If they weren't Jewish, that was where salvation came from. And Jesus said, I've got something different. Salvation is through me and the way you come in contact with me and my blood is through baptism. And so what He asks for us to do is when we know better, to do better, to act on that knowledge. And, and the thing is, this gaining information should lead to a change of thought, a change of feeling, and a change of action. It is what it should do for us. So if I have to ask the question, what must I do to be saved? Where should I go? Here. God's Word. We're told that God sent His Son. Whoever believes on Him will have eternal life. That God did not send His Son to condemn the world, but the world might be saved through Him. Well, what do I need to do to be saved? Some of us may have been told what we must do to be saved is to say a prayer. Have you ever been told that? You ever read that? I have. I sit down with very sincere people who believe this. The problem is it's not here. Now the person that told you this or the person who shared this with you, I do not think them bad. I do not think them evil. I do not think that they're trying to hurt you. They're trying to help you in their mind to get you closer to Christ. But if I'm going to help you try to get you closer to Christ, I want to do it the way that Jesus said do it. There's some would say, you know what, the, the way that people are saved is through predestination, that God has already pre-chosen who will be saved and who will be lost. And there's nothing you can do about it. Well, even though the word predestines in the Bible, the thought that God has predetermined who is, out, who is going to be saved and you don't have a choice in the matter is anti-scriptural. It's not there. There's some that believe, you know what? Yes, we, we should be baptized, but what we're going to do is baptize babies. I understand the desire for this. Everybody wants somebody to be saved? Absolutely. You want best for your children? Absolutely. Child baptism came about during a time that uh, there were two things. One, there was a belief in inherited sin. In other words, you were born sinful. And also during a time that infant mortality rate was really high. And what they would do is, can you imagine having a baby and you're not going to choose a name for a week or two weeks or a month because you don't know if the baby's going to live or not? Through this time is where child baptism became a thing. Because they wanted to, to ensure that if something happened to that child, that they'd be saved. That was their thought. I appreciate the thought, but it's not biblical. I think the desire of wanting our children to be saved is one of the greatest desires we have. One of the reasons that you have brought your children here this morning is for that, right? You want them to know God. You want them to learn that. But we don't find it in Scripture. Some people will say, you know what? You should be baptized, but you don't have to be immersed. We can just pour water over your head and that will count. It's not in Scripture. It's not there. 
Listen, if, if you have found this in your Bible, if you find that sinner's prayer is what God wants us to do, if you, you believe that infant baptism is what God wants us to do and you have Scripture, I'd love to discuss this with you after. I would. I'm not talking about debate you. I would love to listen. Because if I can learn more and do better, I want to learn more and do better. There are also those that believe you have to be immersed. That means to go fully under. But it's not to be saved. It's because you were already saved at an earlier time and you're baptized later. And they would say, I'm being baptized to obey God. But it's not in Scripture. So what is? Jesus says in, in, in Mark's account of the Great Commission, He says this, Go into all the world and proclaim the gospel to the whole creation. Whoever believes and is baptized will be saved. Whoever does not believe will be condemned. Words of Jesus. Who determines what we must do to be saved? Jesus does. It's His salvation. It is His blood that cleanses us from sins. It is His preparation of heaven, right? He's going to prepare a place for us. He is going to do that. So He determines who's in or out, if you will. And He says, this is what we must do in order to be saved. What I want us to do is I want us to walk through the book of Acts this morning. And I want you to see that time and time again, it's beautiful. When people knew better, they did better. When people saw what they needed to do, when they learned what God wanted them to do to be saved, that is what they chose to do. And may we do the same. See, in the book of Acts, the very beginning, chapter 1 of the book of Acts, Jesus goes back to heaven. He ascends back. And what He does is He leaves people here to do His will. It would be the, the disciples also, the church begins in Acts chapter 2. We talked about it a little bit during Bible class. But as we look here, and how do I become a Christian, that is what is asked right here. Even though they didn't call it Christian yet, they wanted to be saved. So in Acts 2.36 and following, Peter says, let all the house of Israel know that for certain that God has made Him both Lord and Christ, this Jesus whom you crucified. And when they heard this, the audience hears this, the, the people gathered to hear this message, since they were cut to the heart and said to Peter and the rest of the disciples, Brothers, what shall we do? And Peter said to them, Repent and be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. The people in the audience were believers in God. They were Jewish. Listen, they are at a Jewish feast of Pentecost. They're there because they are devout in what they do. And they hear this message and they need to know that they have just done what? They have just killed the Messiah. The one they have waited for to, to come throughout all their, their life and the generations before them. And their thought is, what shall we do? I love that a, a good brother came up to me and said it hit him this morning. Think about this. God said, Peter said, you murdered the Son of God. And He has this gift for you. Of salvation. Would you be shocked at that? I would. He wants people to be saved. And, and so He says what you must do is repent. Turn your life toward Him. Look at Him. Walk away from this life you're living before. Walk toward Him and be baptized. And if you choose to do that, your sins will be taken away. You receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. He continues on. So for this promise is to you and your children and all who are afar off and everyone whom the Lord God calls to Himself. And with many other wor words He bore witness and continued to exhort them, saying, Save yourselves from this crooked generation. So those who received His word were baptized, and they were added that day about 3,000 souls. I love the scriptural uh, information we have that says we can preach a long time. It says with many other words He kept exhorting. All right? And the Bible says let your prayers be short, but you can preach as long as you want. I know lunch is waiting. All right? I, I, I am aware. I have seen people try to debate this verse and say it didn't actually say you have to repent and be baptized to be saved. They said salvation is nowhere in verse 38. 
Well, it's in verse 40. Is it not? Save yourself from this crooked generation. In other words, you have to make a decision. And here's what I love. 3,000 of them did. 3,000 of them chose to what? To believe that Jesus was the Son of God. To turn to Him. What did they show us? When they knew better, they did better. Turn to Acts chapter 8, if you will. In Acts chapter 8, we read about an Ethiopian eunuch or nobleman. And I think it's an incredible story. And we read about this and realize that this man has made a trip from Ethiopia to Jerusalem. That is 1,500 miles in a chariot. He didn't fly. He didn't get to take a bus. He went there. Why? Because as a proselyte, that is somebody who's converted to Judaism, he would have to go to so many feasts per year, and he would want to go and be a part of this. Not only that, when he gets there, because of what is said, he is not even allowed to go inside the assembly. He can come and make, have sacrifice made, but he can't even go in. Let that. Would, would you do that? What if there was, uh, y'all may have a mailbox. We have a mailbox at our congregation that's outside that the people who want to uh, can drop their giving in. Sometimes they, they want to do that. Can you imagine say, oh yeah, by the way, we know you've come from this far, but because of what the Old Testament says, you can drop your giving in the box, but you can't come in the doors. That's what he dealt with. It had to do with him being a eunuch. It wasn't a race issue. That's, that was... What was I, I can't believe how devout this guy was. There's people this morning who wouldn't drive across Buford to be here. I did some calculating last night. If you would like to go to Mount Rushmore, it's, it's between 1,500 and 1,600 miles from Buford, Georgia, from this building. Would you go that far to make sacrifice and worship? Is this a good man? Absolutely it's a good man. Is this a guy who loved God? Absolutely he's a guy who loves God. Here's the problem. He's not saved. He's not saved. Look what it said here. And, and the Spirit said to Philip, Acts 8 verse 29, Go over and join his chariot. So Philip ran to him and heard him reading Isaiah the prophet and asked, Do you understand what you're reading? And he said, How can I unless someone guides me? And he invited Philip up to sit with him. Is he a good man? Absolutely. He's reading God's Word. He's reading from the book of Isaiah. I would guess 52, 53, somewhere in there, talking about the Messiah coming, the suffering servant. And does he want to know more? Yes. Can, can you come up and teach me this? And he does. So then Philip opened his mouth, beginning with Scripture, and told him the good news about Jesus Christ. And as they were going along the road, they came to some water, and the eunuch said, See, here is water. What prevents me from being baptized? Listen. Teaching somebody in the gospel, teaching somebody the gospel involves teaching them about baptism. It must. Because he didn't know anything about it before Philip got in the chariot with him. And his first response is this, Hey, I have known something. I, I did the best I knew with what I had. But now that I know that I need to be baptized, what, what stops me? Nothing. He commanded the chariot to stop. And they both went down into the water, and Philip and the eunuch, and he baptized him. And when they came up out of the water, the Spirit of the Lord carried Philip away, and the eunuch saw him no more, and he went on his way rejoicing. And now for the first time, there's going to be a Christian in Ethiopia. How awesome. <laughs> Why? Because this man did what he knew. But when he knew better, he did better. When he was taught the gospel and he realized what God wanted him to do, he commanded a chariot to stop. Here's water. I want to be baptized for my sins. When? Now. Now. Acts chapter 9, we read about the conversion of Saul, who we would know as Paul. As we look, Saul would be his Hebrew name, and, and his Greek name would, would be Paul. Realize that he didn't change his name, it's just how he was referred to in Scripture. 
And as we look at this, it, look how he starts. In chapter 9, verse 1, what we read is that, But Saul, still breathing threats and murder against the disciples of the Lord, went to a high priest and asked him for letters of the synagogues at Damascus. So if he found any that belonged to the way, men or women, he might bring them bound to Jesus. You know what happened to him? He brought them bound. Some would be executed. They'd be imprisoned. Why? They're Christians. They're people who have confessed Jesus' name, been baptized for remission of their sins. He believed that they were committing blasphemy against God. And so he wanted them arrested. And we go from there to after Jesus meets him on the road, lets him know. He says, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? There's a lesson, by the way. When we persecute the body of Christ, we persecute Jesus. When we mistreat the body of Christ, we mistreat Jesus. When we neglect the body of Christ, we neglect Jesus. Why do you, why do you persecute me? And he is told to go to the street, the street called Straight. When you get there, there will be somebody come tell you what to do. What happens? A man comes to him and says, And now why do you wait? Acts twenty two sixteen. Rise and be baptized and wash away your sins, calling on His name. Back to chapter 9, verse 18. And immediately something like scales fell from his eyes. He regained his sight, and he rose and was baptized. And taking food, he was strengthened. Don't miss this. This man hadn't eaten for three days. He's fasted for three days. He's told what to do to be saved. And what he says is, hey, can I get a snack first? I'm starving. Nope. Why? Because when he knew better... He did better. When he realized what God wanted him to do, that what he was doing was wrong, he changed his life. He changed his his knowledge changed. Therefore, his feelings changed. Therefore, his actions changed. And he went from being a devout Jew to a devout Christian. Following Jesus with the same fervor that he had followed God before. And we see that when he knew better, he did better. There's a man named Cornelius. If we go on to Acts chapter 10. Look what the Bible says about this man. In Acts chapter 10 says, At Caesarea there was a man named Cornelius, a centurion of what was known as the Italian cohort. He was a devout man who feared God with all of his household. He gave alms generously to the people and prayed continually to God. At the end of the chapter, And he commanded them to be baptized in the name of Christ, they asked him to remain, and they did. Don't miss this. Cornelius is a good man. Wouldn't you agree? He's somebody who is a devout. He believes in God. He is somebody who, who believes in Him, who also does what? He's generous with his money. He wants to take care of people. He is somebody when he sees a need, he meets it. All this stuff was not enough. He did the best he could with what he knew, but when he knew he needed to be baptized, guess what? He was baptized, he and his family together. Why? Because when he knew better, he did better. In Acts chapter 19, as Paul is traveling, he comes across some disciples of John the Baptist, John the Immerser. And this is a very interesting exchange to me because, again, these people are devout. (laughs) These people not only love John, but they love Jesus. And they are doing the best they can with what they have. Look at Acts 19, beginning in verse 1. And the Scripture says, And it happened that while Paulus was at Corinth, Paul passed through the inland country and came to Ephesus. There he found some disciples, and he said to them, Did you receive the Holy Spirit when you believed? And they said, No, we have not even heard that there's a Holy Spirit. And he said, Into what were you baptized? And they said, Into John's baptism. And Paul said, John baptized with the baptism of repentance, telling people to believe in the one that was to come after him. That is Jesus. On hearing this, they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. I love that. Because when they heard about Jesus from John, guess what? They wanted to be obedient to Jesus. They did what He asked them to do. Now that they find out, they hear from from an apostle of what they need to be doing, the first response is this. I love that it's weird that between verses 4 and 5, there's no debate. 
It's not like, you know, uh, I, I think what I did was good enough. You know, John's a really good guy. I, I'd, hate to, uh, uh, I, I'd hate to defame his memory. You know, he's a martyr, you know. He, he gave his life. And I, I'd hate to defame his name. And, and, and you know what, my, my, some, there's some other family that's not with us today, and they, they understood this. That's what they did. When they heard what they needed to do, they did it immediately. Because when they knew better, they did better. There's a lot of debate about smoking, but I'll tell you one thing that can't be debated is whether it's healthy or not. It's not healthy. We're not taking Radithor to help with our joint pain because we realize it can kill us. We're we're not going around painting with lead paint or using asbestos because we realize the long-term effects this can have. Since that knowledge led to a change of thought that led to a change of feeling that led to a change of action. What should change us about knowing that Jesus died on a cross and was raised on the third day? And that what Jesus has told us to do to be saved and what He showed us time and time again in Scripture is that what we must do is believe and be baptized for remission of our sins. The question is for us, When we know better, will we do better? Will we make that decision today to follow Him? Will you make that decision to follow Him? Maybe today that you say, Craig, this is what I needed. I want to be like that Ethiopian. Hey, is there water? There's water right behind here. I don't know if you know that or not, but behind this screen there's water. I was at one congregation one day, and I, I, had, I rolled in about time to speak, and I got up there and said, the water is ready, and one of the deacons went, They were having baptistry problems, all right? The water is ready, correct? It's ready. It's there. All it needs is for you to confess the sweet name of Jesus and give your life over to Him. Whatever you've done before, whatever sin you've committed, be taken away. And I know people may have told you before what you understood you needed to do to become a Christian may have been to say a prayer. Or to be sprinkled or whatever else. And the thing is, you can say, for what I knew, I did based on what I knew because I thought that was pleasing to God. But now I know what God wants. It's right here in Scripture over and over again. And today, I want to obey Him. I want to show that when I know better, I do better. So today, I invite you to do just that. If we can help you with this, would you come now while we stand and while we sing? sing one more song this morning. Before we do that, um, we'd love to have a record of your, of your attendance. Use, uh, use the QR code in the pew in front of you on that little sheet of paper. Um, there's one for guests, one for members. We'd love to have a record of your attendance um, today. So we're coming back at one, right? We're going to go eat first, and I guess rush down there before Ben. Um, and uh, yes, yeah, so we'll meet back at one o'clock. It'll be good. All right, let's sing. Uh, am I missing anything? No? All right, let's sing uh, one verse of 581, sing on.
Sing on, ye joyful pilgrims, nor think the moment long. My faith is heavenward rising with every tuneful song. Lo, on the mount of blessing, the glorious mount I send, and true God, the one who has planned out our salvation. Father, we come to you this morning thanking you for this wonderful weekend, for the harvest uh, theme, for the stories about how we can come back to you, how we can respond to your invitation. Father, it was mentioned earlier that uh, Sister Virginia Paul suffered a fall yesterday, and we, we do want to offer our prayers this morning for her. And Father, as we go from this place today, as we go back to our daily lives, that we can carry the lessons that we've learned this week, this weekend, that we can seize every opportunity that we have to tell people about Jesus and about the plan of salvation that you have planned for us as a way to return because you love us so. Father, we're going to take a break now as we go downstairs to uh, enjoy a meal together. We just ask your blessings on the food and for those that have prepared it, help it to give us the strength that we need to get through this coming week. Father, be with us in everything we undertake and help us to realize that everything we do is because of you and that everything we have is because of you and our very lives are dependent on you. Father, be with us and help us. It's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. 